Hello, thank you for being here. I'm going to talk about actually family history, which is kind of fun because uh, that doesn't come up all that often. So, learning about the 19th century through personal correspondence has its pitfalls, I can tell you, but it also allows for an intimate look into individuals and their relationships. Letters meant only for the eyes of the addressee are often cryptic in their meaning unless we do a deep dive into the history of the letter writer and understand the world from where they came. When I was gifted a trove of family letters written between 1863 and 1920, I had already studied quite a bit of Midwestern history, specifically the lead mine district of the upper Mississippi River Valley where the letters originated. I've also conducted a lot of research into the history of the Galena area and my family here. All of this came about because I had a wonderful uncle named Richard or Uncle Dick Leakley. And Uncle Dick uh, led me into history through uh, family history and through Galena history. So I was living in the suburbs of Chicago where I grew up, but my grandparents on my mother's side were brought up in Galena as were their people back. So I'm the fifth generation and my daughter here is sixth generation for Galena. And she was raised in Galena. So coming back to Galena was very exciting. Um, I heard about Galena. My uncle took me there with my aunt and my mother when I was a teenager. And I fell in love. And a lot of people will say I had the Galena fever, which is a play on words for the fever river, which is what our river was called uh, until, well, it's still called that in Wisconsin. You try to tell a Wisconsin person it's Galena River. They're like, no, it's called the fever. So I can, <laughs> I can assure you of that. So Uncle Dick led me into this, and I want to thank him for that because I also got a trove of his uh, uh, correspondence. I've got a number of things from him in terms of uh, photographs, all kinds of family history stuff. So, so a group of about 32 of these letters drew my attention as they are dated from 1863 to 1865, which was during the Civil War. So I was expecting, like, wow, that's going to be very cool. So... Um, she was the eldest child of George and Tamer Rain Leakley, who were born in, uh, she was born in New Diggins, Wisconsin in 1849. She was born in September, she was a Virgo. When she was just 14, her parents thought it was wise to send her to St. Mary's Hall. And uh, this was a boarding school in Burlington, New Jersey. Uh, to me, this seems like an odd choice as the family appears to have no real connection to New Jersey. Um, the academy was considered more expensive than the local high schools or the private Platteville Academy, which was already in uh, already taking in students of both genders and um, making the journey to take her to school and pick her up again was really challenging because it was far away. And well, there was a civil war going on. But um, anyway, they decided to do that. So the school did have a very good reputation, started by an Episcopal bis bishop in the 1830s. It was the first school to educate young females on an equal footing with the best of the male only schools. By the mid 19th century, girls attending St. Mary's studied biology, French, Greek, and other liberal arts subjects, including philosophy. Anglo-American mining activity, um, was the main occupation of the newcomers. George and Tamer's parents came to America in a chain migration of family and friends from England, settling in ethnic enclaves around Galena. Mary Jane's father, George, born in Middleton and Teasdale County, Durham, um, he arrived in, Pens in uh, Philadelphia. His family arrived in Philadelphia when George was only five years old. After several years in the coal mines of Pennsylvania, they made their way to Galena, Illinois, in the mining district by 1834. They were digging for lead ore and building rude housing in a hamlet called Millbrig. I just wanted to show you those pictures of Durham County because those pictures are all about lead mining there. And this very same people who were mining there came here and then they just did the same thing and brought all their skills with them. They went into an area just north of Galena, digging for lead ore. 
And the hamlet was called Millbrig. And that's because it was by a mill building and a brig is a bridge. So it's by the bridge, by the mill. And that was um, in Council Hill Township. So what I'm pointing out there with the uh, circled area is where Millbrig was. So Bell's Mill was there and that was owned by uh, George's brother, Thomas Leakley and a uh, Mr. William Bell. And that enclave had a primitive Methodist church, a Methodist church. It has a badger hut, but I'm not gonna be able to get into that too much tonight, but that's a, a type of housing in the early days. And um, I'm guessing though, that the family came in 1834 and they knew about the Black Hawk War and the disturbances where uh, whites were trespassing on Native American land. And so Native Americans were, were rebelling. And in that rebellion, it caused a lot of mayhem and death on both sides. So I'm wondering if maybe they waited till 1834 to come to this area, hoping that things would settle down. So Millbrig is just up, uh, up the Galena River. So, you know, if you're going up the Galena River from here, you're going to hit all these little mining communities. Maybe you've driven that way, and so you've seen that. So the settlements in Council Hill were built around a lead furnace and a mill site owned, like I say, by Thomas Bales, George's brother, and William Bell. Uh, George's father, who brought all the kids um, when George was only five, right? And his dad only lived until 1839, and he's buried in Old City Cemetery here in Galena, although he doesn't have a stone. We know that from the Sexton's records, which tell you who's buried where. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure he had a stone. Uh, they would have had enough money to do that, but it's gone. So... <clears throat> So um, his mother, Mary Armstrong Leakley, remained with all the children in Consul Hill. Her oldest son, John, arrived to the Galena area from England in 1844. So he was the last of the children, of their children to come. John and his family were instrumental in founding the, the primitive Methodist church in this region. His mother, Mary, involved herself in the work of nurturing the newly founded Midwestern church. Uh, this sect comes from England. Um, and it was very attractive to mining families and laboring families. So these folks were pretty much rebelling against the Methodist church because they seemed too high class. They were charging lots of money for pews to sit in the pews at church, for example. So there was uh, a distinction between the primitive Methodists and the Methodists at that time. Um, so George's parents, um, And their neighbors arrived to the Illinois-Wisconsin border between 1834 and 1842. So the whole family, whole Leakley family was here by then of those who were going to come. I just wanted to show you that in case you don't know the area that well. I'm trying to show you Galena in the yellow. And then you go up the Galena River and you see lead mine. Is, I made that yellow. And you can see New Diggins. So right in the area between lead mine and New Diggins is where George Leakley, our boarding school girl, Mary Jane, where her dad had a smelting furnace and mines. Mm -hmm. So Galena was a Southern entrepot of the upper Mississippi mining district. And the Fever River is home to some of the most productive lead mines right along the river. Despite the challenging federal rules concerning mining and smelting and the travails of being immigrants to a new land in frontier communities, the Leakleys did extremely well. Tamer Rain Leakley, George's young wife, was born in Pennsylvania. The Rains arrived at the Illinois-Wisconsin borderlands by 1846 after spending some time in the East. Her father was a primitive Methodist preacher, and her people included a number of miners, and she was the eldest of a large family. So just up the Fever River, then, we have Council Hill Township, which and then we have the mining camp at New Diggins. By 1850, New Diggins had grown from a body frontier outpost to a stable village. The census records from that year list 1,741 people living in New Diggins Township. In the early migration period of 1820 to 1840, miners tended to build rude housing. A few families were able to finance the building of smelting furnaces. 
The region attracted men and their families from Southern Illinois and Missouri, but also from the East. Many immigrants came from England and Ireland. George and Tamar Rain were married in December 1848 in New Diggins when he was 24 and she was but 16. When Mary Jane was born in September 1849, the first child of George and Tamer, the state of Wisconsin was newly formed after many decades of its existence as a territory. The lead mining boom had just passed its peak, the easy ore was already mined out, and the international competition was growing. It was also just a year before the US government opened up the lead district to private ownership. Before 1848, all lead-bearing lands were administered by the federal government in a leasing program. George quickly saw his wealth and status grow. His neighbors were old compatriots and neighbors from England, the Bainbridges, the Sedgwicks, the Egglestons, were all North English families. With the help of his older brother, Thomas, George was already a smelter by age 25. When the 1850 census was taken, baby Mary Jane lived with her parents and her aunt Elizabeth Rain, age 16, and a 13-year-old orphaned cousin. Her family's real estate was valued at $400. Just 10 years later in 1860, the family's real estate was valued at $20,000 and their personal estate valued at $10,000. By that time, George was listed as master smelter. Tamer had birthed five additional children in those years one of whom uh, un only lived a year. They had an 18 year old servant living with them along with Tamer's mother and an uncle. George held at least 168 acres of land at the north end of the village of New Diggins and at least another 140 on the Fever River where he had his lead smelter and mines. He had a crew of workers who mined the lead ore, processed it and then smelted it in his furnace. It was dangerous work. In 1862, Joseph Coulthard of New Diggins was killed in one of George's mines when an ore can suspended at the top of the shaft slip, slipped from its hook and fell to the bottom, striking Coulthard on the head and killing him instantly. Mary Jane grew up in rather simple beginnings, but by the time she reached her teen years, her family seemed to be grappling with the reality of their newly acquired wealth. I wanna just mention this map. This is a plat map from the 1870s. And what I've outlined there for you is the property of George Leakley uh, estate, cause he had passed already and we'll get to that, but also of uh, Robert Champion, because I find it interesting, the Champion and Leakley relationship. I don't know if anyone knows that name. It's a local name. Um, I love the name Champion as a last name. I mean, I'm kind of jealous. Um, but I just think it's interesting. We have some stories that relate to these two families. So I wanted to show you that they actually were neighbors and on contiguous land. Mary Jane, uh, so she went off to attend um, St. Mary's Hall and she only had one local friend who also attended and that was Julia Champion the daughter of this Robert H. Champion I mentioned, an Easterner who removed to St. Louis prior to settling in Wisconsin. He was a very successful lead miner and smelter. In 1861, Robert H. Champion struck a big lead. The mineral taken from that mine amounted to 7 million pounds, which commanded from 60 to $80 per thousand pounds, enriching the owners and creating a renewed interest in the diggings, which were being a little bit abandoned in the 1850s and because things were slowing down with the lead trade. But this big find was amazing. So you can see on the map, see where the river goes um, across the map there. The Champion Mining Company was still there in the 1870s, but it started earlier and he owned all that land plus the land north of that, which you can see on the map. In the 1860 census, the champions had real estate valued at $135,000 and 2,000 in personal estates. So they were some, one of the wealthier families in the area. Their property holdings included land adjacent to the Leakley farm and mining and smelting operations. Perhaps there is a feeling of wanting to be like the champions. 
Julia Champion was a few years older than Mary Jane, and perhaps Mary Jane looked up to her. Or perhaps George and Tamer determined that if St. Mary's Hall in Burlington, New Jersey was the right school for Julia Champion, well, then it must be the right thing for their daughter. During her first term at school, Mary Jane shared an alcove, as she called it, with Julia and another girl and seemed very pleased with the arrangement. The first of the saved letters was written in February of 1863 by Uncle Thomas L. Rain, who was an, at age 18, he was only four years older than Mary Jane. He told Mary Jane that a terrible sickness was going around in the vicinity of Georgia's smelting operation. There was three burials yesterday. One of them was one of your schoolmates, Miss Annie Biggs. She ate her supper and felt well and hearty Sunday night, and Monday night she was dead. It was a slaying thing. He also mentions their cousin, John Thompson Leakley, was home for a month on furlough. It seems strange how few mentions there are of the Civil War in these letters. Mary Jane had several uncles and at least two first cousins fighting in the war. In 1863, her cousin Joseph B. Leakley of Consul Hill was captured in Resaca, Georgia, and transported to the dreaded Andersonville prison. He died there of scurvy in September of 1864. There's no mention of his capture, death, or funeral in these letters. There is so little mention of the war that one would not know there was a national calamity going on until the war actually ended. Was the family trying to avoid hard and tragic topics as they exchanged letters with a teenager? They did write about family sickness, local community illnesses, and other sad topics, but the Civil War seems to have not entered their minds as they put pen to paper. That is until it affected them very personally. One mention of the war was written by Father George to daughter Mary Jane in October of 1864. He wrote about his recent experiences while in Philadelphia, commenting, I am so sorry you did not see the large Union torchlight procession on Saturday night. It was the greatest turnout I've ever saw. It took it two and a half hours to go by my hotel. The streets were perfectly ablaze and jammed with people. Another instance was in March, 1865, when George was called up for the draft. Tamer wrote to Mary Jane. Well, I'll stay there. Pa is feeling better than last I wrote you, but he ought for the draft came off last week and who should be drafter but Mr. George Leakley. What do you think about that? I think it's just as mean as can be for he got a certificate of exemption long ago and now some rascal has put his name on the roll just to give him trouble, but they won't make much of him for he's not going to report or trouble about it. He's just going to stay home and mind his own business. He says if he ever finds out who put his name on that roll, he will cane him and serves him right, the scamp. <laughs> Another letter dated December 1864 from Mary Jane to her mother laments that her cousin, James Frederick Leakley, was thinking of joining the war effort. Mary wrote, I was very agreeably surprised last week by receiving a letter from Fred. Poor boy, he talks of joining the army after Christmas. Oh, how I wish he would listen to good advice and go to school this winter. He does not write any too well. By the way, she spelled that too, T-O, not T-O-O. I thought that was funny. <laughs> Poor fellow, he will be repent bitterly for his folly when he grows older. Little bossy Virgo. In fact, Fred was at, at, at age 17, already enlisted in the Union Army. He had been attending Shimer Academy in Mount Carroll when he decided to enlist. According to his military records, he enlisted in April of 1864 in Company C, 43th, 45th Regiment. That's the local regiment. Known as the Washbourne Lead Mine Regiment, it was organized in Galena in December of 1861. Fred became quite ill by October of 1864 after contracting tuberculosis and was homesick in Galena. Was he thinking of rejoining after the holidays in 1864? His military records state he was homesick in Galena, Illinois from October 1864 through June of 1865. Company C, 45th Regiment, was mustered out at Louisville in July of 1865, but Fred was absent sick at home. He received a Certificate of Disability for Discharge after being examined in May of 1865. This is all alluded to in a letter from Tamer to Mary Jane. She wrote, James 
Frederick is at home quite sick. There's no mention of Fred being injured at a battle. However, when an old when he was an old widower, James Frederick actually lived with my mother's family in Chicago. She remembered that part of her grandfather's middle finger was missing. She would have the grand, he would have the grandkids touch his finger while he told a story of how it was blown off in the Civil War. This seems a tall tale as there's no record of an injury that he had during the Civil War. However, he did have a cousin who lost a middle finger at the Battle of Shiloh. Oh, maybe it was projecting. I don't know. 18 letters survived from the year 1864. The topics of discussion included the health of the family members at home, Mary Jane's health, and her friends and teachers at school. Father George appears to have been very engaged in his daughter's development at school. He was concerned about her happiness while she was away. In January 1864, he wrote, I am very much gratified to hear that you are well and that you are contented with your school teachers and would again advise you to keep away from all scholars that is continually complaining of the school teachers and wants to be home, homesickness, praying for vacation and everything but minding their business and studies for they will only make you miserable and discontented. It is perfectly natural for you to think about home and want to see us. And I assure you there is nothing in this world that would give us all more pleasure than to see you at home. You are missed and wanted every day, but as you was placed in school to inform your mind and to expand your intellect, to fix and form your character for your future life, whatever habits and sayings and ways and manners you contract now will be apt to remain through life. And I wish you to be very particular who you make companions of. I have no doubt that you have all kinds at school but you must be careful who you choose to go with. Avoid any girls that isn't strictly moral and of good habits. So my dear child, apply yourself to your studies and let us see how, you can, how far you can reach before you return home. I often regret that I did not, when I was at school, pay more attention to these studies. I hope you'll avoid my mistake, dear Mary. George also tried to convince Mary Jane that she should stay at school over the upcoming spring break as there was so much sickness in the country that he didn't want her traveling with a classmate to her home and go among strangers for the vacation. In most of the letters from George to his daughter, he enclosed, he enclosed money to pay her bills and to buy what she needed. The amounts ranged from $5 to $20 each time. In a later letter dated January 15, 1865, George wrote, we are sorry to hear your downcast spirits and being so despondent. We can't account for it, and it really makes us feel bad and uneasy, for we supposed that you was happy and comfortable, and in reading your letter, it makes us feel disappointed. We hope, however, that you aren't too bad, as your letter shows. But my child, you must consider that it's for your benefit we placed you in school. Though you are a great expense to us, we nevertheless are willing to pay it as long as you as long as uh, we care for the good of you. We know very well that you can't learn much if you're not perfectly satisfied and feeling at home. You are better at home here unless you can feel happy and satisfied. In general, Mary Jane replied to her father's letters by addressing her letters to her mother. The letters reveal a close relationship between mother and daughter. Perhaps being only 17 years apart, they're able to communicate in a youthful, almost playful repartee. In an example, Mary Jane, who frequently called herself by her chosen nickname, Molly, wrote to her mother saying, how I hail Saturday when I can sit down and have a confidential chat with my own dear mother. I never knew how to, evaluate, how to value it until I am far away. Never mind when I get home again. I will sit down beside you and I'll never move once. Molly mentioned her grades, writing, I expect you've received my report by this time. Is it any improvement on the others? Keep them all until I return home, so I will see what I've been doing for the last term. I got an eight for conduct, but I tried real hard to get nine. Julia Champion got five, so I did a great deal better than she did, but I'll tell you the reason why. One night, Miss Darlington said to Julia to go to her alcove, and she said, I shall not go until the bell rings. After she got in bed, Miss Darlington said, Julia, I, when I tell you to do things, 
I do not wish for you to say, I will not go until I'm ready, but I want you to go when I tell you to go. Julius said, I shall be likely to say the same again. <laughs> Wherefore, she had to go and sleep in the nursery and got a five for conduct in the bargain. Living in a dorm had its downsides for sure. Mary Jane relayed, oh yes, I've got something to tell you, but you must not tell anyone. The fashion for wearing the hair now is rolling it. Julia often rolls mine for me. So one Saturday, she asked me if I wouldn't comb her hair with a fine comb. And lo, what do you think I found? Two big nits. You would guess the rest for yourself. You never saw a girl jump up and down as she did. She acted like a crazy girl. There's one girl here named Libby Breaker. There is this one girl, I mean, I will not go near her for her hair is full of live critters. Her hair is very short. And when you go behind her, you can see them. Don't you think it's awful? George seemed to be worried about Mary Jane's health and his own. He got word that she was not feeling well that winter and wrote, I was very sorry to hear that you have not been well. So much sickness all over the country makes us feel very uneasy about your health. We want you to be very particular about your health and not expose yourself to any cold unless you are properly clad and be careful to keep your feet dry and warm. Take all the outdoor exercise you can, but be careful not to overdo yourself. I am much pleased to see such a good report card from you. And at the same time, we don't wish you to study so hard to injure your health. Good health is the first thing to take care of and then your studies. You must let us know when you write all about your health and keep nothing back from us. <laughs> he also worried about her mental health and her contentedness. I often think of the long despondent look you gave me when I left you at the hall. It was the hardest thing of my life to leave you to the care of strangers. All kinds of thoughts rose up in my mind. And as a father who loves his child and wishes to see you a good scholar, I strove against all my feelings and trusted in God to take care of you, which I pray he will that you can come home to see us again. Mary Jane, in response, shrugged off their worries. I've just been out to the gymnasium and about half an hour's marching and exercising, and I don't feel much more tired than when I went out. What makes you and Pa so anxious about me? I'm not sick, only have a headache once in a while, which is nothing more than when I'm at home. I'm very glad that you've escaped the sickness, which is all over the neighborhood, and so thankful that Pa's health is so much better. Over time, it seemed there was more stress related to poor health. George had contracted some kind of lung disease, perhaps tuberculosis. In June of 1864, he wrote, you appear to be very anxious about my health, which is very natural. My health has only been poorly for some time, and I was quite sick a few days last week on account of taking cold, but I'm now pretty well and improving and in hopes that I will be well again in a few days. You must not expect that I will be robust as I used to be. Thus, however, I hope to be passably well. I'm very glad that you're in good health and you're getting along well. Mary Jane gave her parents a glimpse of her school life. In a letter addressed to my darling mother, she wrote, Oh, dear, there's so much noise here I can't write. Just imagine you see a long schoolroom filled with desks and quite scattered here in their writing. In the back part of the room, you will see a person quite intent on writing to her dear mother by name of Mary Leakley. I suppose when you see me next summer, you will say, fat as ever. I cannot get thin. Thin. We are all, <laughs> I cannot get thin. We are all very busy preparing for the examination. I do hope I will be promoted. Miss Stanley said I could be promoted if I got good marks for my lessons. I think I have, haven't I? This month, I've only had one eight, and that is for conduct. I tried hard, but I couldn't get a 10. It's utterly impossible. In almost all the letters, there's talk of the five younger siblings at home in New Diggins. Mary Jane seemed particularly attached to her two little sisters, Julia Ellen, familiarly called Nellie or Ellie, and Henrietta Clay, nicknamed Nettie. Mary Jane had a little sister, only two years her junior, who died when a toddler. She also had two brothers, John Rain Leakley and Thomas Armstrong Leakley. The next in birth order was Nellie, five years younger than Mary Jane. She had another little sister, Anna, who was born but died within the first year. Nettie came next and was 11 years younger. 
While Mary Jane was at school, her youngest sibling, baby Georgie, was born. She presented herself as the older sister, clucking that she hoped her little siblings will be good scholars someday and worried over their health. In her letter home of March 1864, referring to Nettie, she wrote, the dear little ducky, how I should love to see her. I expect she's quite a young lady by this time. I expect she will not speak to me when I get home. She will be so proud. Tell her I have kissed this paper 70 times for her and Ellie. In the many preceding letters, there's no mention of Tamer being pregnant or of any particular fatigue. Yet George reports on the baby and mother a week after his birth. Our baby is growing and is a fine little fellow. Your ma is getting better and will soon be well again. I suppose she was pregnant so many times that it wasn't a big deal. It appears Tamer teased Mary Jane about wanting to see boys. In reply, Mary wrote, you ask me if I do not try to, uh, to get a sly peek at the college boys. Of course I do. And do not care if Mr. Smith does see one, but they are only a little set of jacks. There are very few that are even as tall as I am. Julia Champion was set to graduate from St. Mary's Hall. Her brother Charlie was coming for her, and there was a hope that he would pick up Mary Jane as well and bring her home to, to uh, Galena, New Diggins area for the spring break. But for some reason, George was expecting to meet him in Philadelphia, but Charlie never showed up. In a letter, George wrote, there's nothing the matter between us and the champions that we are aware of and can't account for their conduct toward us, but I suppose it's for want of common courtesy and sense. Mary Jane wrote freely to her ma and at times teased her for her vanity. She wrote, dear ma, I wish you would send me a pie. Oh no, send me a baked potato and a piece of beef steak. That would taste so good. Oh dear, you say it is snowing and very dreary. And so you went down to see Mr. Champion to make believe you wanted to see about me, but I know what for. You wanted to show your new fur. Now, don't deny it, vain little mother. Well, never mind. Of course, you must look pretty since you've got your teeth in. And for the furs, they are so pretty. Of course, you must show them. Oh, how I should like to be home this Christmas. Ain't it too bad? In early May 1864, Mary Jane was quite happy to report that she was promoted in school and as a result, changed rooms in the dormitory. I am a middle B and I've got a nice alcove in Miss Lizzie Stanley's dormitory now. And isn't that nice? It's a lovely little alcove, just large enough to hold my bed, trunk, and a washstand. When Julia went away, she gave me her mat. I spread that between the bed and the washstand. My trunk is in one corner. I've got six pictures hanging around in fancy frames and their photographs. Now, don't you think that's nice? I study philosophy and botany now, the history of English, England. I wish I had some news to tell you, but I haven't a single thing to write about. What appears to have been real in her mind was going home for the summer. Mary Jane wrote, only three months more, and then where I will be makes me so joyful to think about when I will once more be within my dear old walls. Oh, won't it be joyful, joyful, joyful when I get home again? Tamer's mother, Jane, Right, White Rain, try to say that 10 times, Jane White Rain from England was a seamstress and it appears Tamer picked up her skills. Mary Jane and Tamer discussed fabrics on many occasions in the letters and they talked about what was suitable for the weather and for special occasions. Mary, Joan, Mary Jane wrote, Dear mother, you asked if I wanted anything, but I wish you would send me some dresses for I hardly know what to get. The girls tell me not to get any muslin ones as they ruin them when they wash them here. Oh yes, I will tell you what I want very badly. It's a wrapper. I want one very bad for when I go to the nursery. Miss Orders says, go get your wrapper child, but I have to tell her I, have, I don't have one. You can get some calico or a Delane or anything you want to. If you have time, make it long to touch the floor about an inch. And if you think I do not need one, well, never mind. But I thought you have a good chance to send it since Charlie was, has so kindly offered to bring something for me. And since my kind, indulgent mother has promised to send me something. A wrapper in the Civil War era was a garment worn by most classes of women. It was more loosely fitting than a dress, but it had a similar silhouette. It was a work dress, a morning garment, a stay-at-home dress, and clearly it, was, clearly it was a la mode at Mary's boarding school in New, Jer in New Jersey. 
In one of the few letters written by Tamar in this period, she replied, you want to know if you can have a new dress? I think not. You must have plenty of dresses and nice ones too. I can't see why your silk should want turning. I was expecting to see it next summer, no worse than new, for it is only one year since it was made. I'm afraid you're getting too careless with your clothes. You will have me scolding without mercy when you come home. I know you have not much time to sew, but when you have a nice dress on, you should be careful and not get it all greasy and soiled. For what is more disagreeable than a young lady with soiled garments, especially one whose mothers tried to teach her right? But I will keep my lecture until next summer. You will not need many dresses for two weeks. Take your white aprons for mornings. It appears that Tamer relented in making a new dress for Mary Jane. Mary Jane wrote, you asked what kind of dresses I would like. Well, you know, it's very warm here and silk tears so easily. I think it, that an organdy would be prettier and more suitable, don't you? I'm going to have my calicos made this week. Dear mother, do not think me extravagant. I do not get anything but what I really need. I often wish I had my dear kind mother to watch over and guide me, for I often do things I'm not supposed to do, but I do try to do right. In a letter dated June 17, 1865, Tamer explained that she hardly had time to write. Your very welcome letter of the first came last Monday and intended to answer before now, but have been very busy sewing. I can't get time to write during the day when the children are gone. And when the children are gone to bed, I'm so tired. If you, but when you soon get home, I shall not have so much to do as you will be helping me. And I expect you'll help me a great deal. Fully expecting to be home when her summer term ended on August 1st, George was forced to take the long journey to pick up his daughter. Instead of going back home to Wisconsin, however, Mary Jane was treated to a six-week six -week trip of a lifetime. She was clearly very excited about this vacation. They visited many of the tourist attractions of the day. They left from Burlington, New Jersey, and arrived in New York City. Mary Jane wrote to her mother, Here I am in this large and noisy city at last. Oh, dear, such a noise I cannot think. Showing her budding self-awareness, she told her mother, tomorrow is August 20th, and Paul will be 40 years old. I cannot bear to think of him getting old, but I need not talk, for when we went to the seashore, I could hardly convince the ladies that he was my father. They thought he was my brother. So you see, I'm getting old too, for I will be 15 next month. But dear me, if I looked as young as I really am, it would be no matter, for some persons have thought me to be fully 17, if not more. Mary Jane, Jane wrote a very excited letter to her mother on September 4th to tell her more about the trip. Dated from Portland, Maine, she told her mother, doubtless you'll be surprised to receive a letter from Portland as you didn't know we were going to go there, but we landed here yesterday afternoon from Boston and our plans to start for the White Mountains tomorrow. To com commence where I left off in my travels, I must take you back to August 29th. Paul went down to the steamer and tried to get staterooms, but they were all full, but he secured us passage on the next, in the next evening. So in the evening, we went to Niblo's theater to see the new play Camille. It was very sad, but I liked it very much. The next day was Tuesday. Well, I had a great deal of packing to do. So in the morning I was busy, but after dinner I walked around a little. At half past four, we were seated in the omnibus going down to the steamer. When we arrived, the first person I saw was Mr. and Mrs. Felt. They had been in New York for several days and had been staying with a cousin. We had a very pleasant time. We arrived in Boston about five o'clock the next morning. Mr. Felt was going to put up at the American house, so we went there thinking it would be pleasant to all be together. Needless to say, meeting up with an acquaintance from Galena, Illinois by chance was certainly a rare treat in the city of over 800,000 people at that time. And Mary Jane was out for a good time. She seemed to enjoy the company. Lucius and Catherine Felt were a prominent Galena merchant family. Uh, they built one of the first grand homes in the new Upper Prospect Street neighborhood in Galena in 1848, employing the newly fashionable architecture known as the Second Empire or Mansard st style of architecture. Lucius was originally from New York and perhaps traveled frequently to visit relatives, and I do know that he did die in New York, so he ended up leaving Galena, or at least he was buried there. I'm not actually sure which. Mary Jane 
continued in her letter. We got ready for breakfast, and while at the table, we made up our plans. We concluded to go out immediately after breakfast, and as Paul was tired, he remained behind. We were traveling along. We went through a very large market. Pretty soon, while we were crossing the street, the first thing I hear was Mr. Felt screaming, Jake, Jake. He's calling another Mr. Felt, a cousin of his. I was introduced to him. Then he wanted us to come up to his house, which we did. Here I met his mother and sister. We had a pleasant time there. We went walking around the city and went into some splendid galleries of art. Then we went back to the hotel for dinner. After dinner, Mr. J. Felt took us all over. Uh, we went to Mount Auburn, a beautiful cemetery. And on our way, we passed Harvard College. We started for the Navy Yard. When we got to the Naval Yard, the officer on guard said, no admittance. He asked what state we were from. Mr. Felt said, Illinois. Then he said we could go through. Remember, it's a civil war. <laughs> we passed some very large ships. There were some very large cannons there. There was one 15 foot in length and 15 inches bore weighing 21 ton. There were some regiment staying there and soldiers in every direction. Mr. J. Felt asked us if we would not like to go on board the monitor which they were building. Oh, I wish you were with us so much. You would have enjoyed it so much. I cannot tell you what the monitor looked like. You may see one sometime. <laughs> Mary Jane and the Felts had the rare pleasure of seeing the final stage of the building of a monitor, which was the first twin screw, wooden hole, double turreted, ironclad monitor used in the Civil War. And it was a game changer for the Civil War. And the fact that they were, happened to be at Boston Harbor right when it was being commissioned is kind of amazing. The studio portraits of George and his daughter, Mary Jane, while they were on their travels were widely shared with the family. So the traveling went on, but eventually Mary Jane was expected back at St. Mary's Hall. After dropping her at school in early October, George returned to Wisconsin, but the stress of his long journey aggravated his lung condition. This is not surprising. George was a lead, in the lead smelting business from an early age. Smelting galena or PBS is, is the process of refining and concentrating the mineral through heat, driving sulfur molecules out of the molten lead. The fumes that are produced are sulfur dioxide gas. When the sulfur dioxide gas reacts with the atmosphere, it turns into acid rain, which can be the cause of chronic lung diseases such as asthma and bronchitis. Early lead mining and smelting were worked without the advantage of good ventilation or filtering, making it very dangerous for the health. Mary Jane might have wanted to return home sooner, but for the kindness of family friends, Mr. John W. Woodruff and his wife, Rebecca, they had lived in Galena for a time, but he decided to move back east near Philadelphia, which is near where Mary's school was. They visited Mary Jane at school and soon acted as surrogate parents. Mary Jane very much enjoyed their company and George encouraged that relationship. George wrote to Mary Jane <clears throat> in a fairly somber letter, but then it took a turn for ex uh, to excitement. I suppose you've heard of the news of the catch capture of Richmond and Lee's whole army. It is good news and makes all loyal people feel glad. I think the war will soon be over. I send you latest news. A week later, he wrote, a week ago, this whole nation was rejoicing in the capture of Lee and his army and the speedy end of the war. Now we are a nation of mourners. What an abominable thing it is to have our beloved president assassinated and that great man, Secretary Seward, one of the greatest men of our nation. I never felt so bad in my life when the news came. It made me sick and throwed me into a fever, and such is life that we do not know when death comes. May God look upon our distracted country and bring the guilty to justice is the hope of all loyal people. George's illness was becoming more chronic. This may account for his disclosure that he was in the process of closing of his businesses. In the collection of family heirlooms is the account book of the TB and G. Leakley lead book, 1859. At some point, a family member used this old book to paste in serial stories, stories from a newspaper, but the second half of the ledger is still intact and you can read it. And it indicates that the lead business belonged to George by himself in the later years. It lists lead made and lead hauled. The last page is from 1863. 
George and his brother Thomas also owned the Galena Woolen Mills and a wholesale, wholesale store at the Galena Levee. <clears throat> By the 1860s, George was closing down all of his affairs. <clears throat> he was sick. George waxed thoughtfully about his life in a rather somber letter to Mary Jane. I know you're very anxious about my health with the rest of the family, particularly your mother, but we will all have to submit to our fate and trust to Providence. And I must say it has been fortunate for my family that a kind Providence has spared my life so long. He was 42 when he died. Though in poor health these last three or four years, and sometimes I thought my condition unbearable that death would be a relief, but God always gave me courage and hope. And I sometimes think that my life is spared only for the good of my wife and children, for I don't think I will ever be able to go into active business again. My health has been greatly improved since spring, though, and I hope it will continue to do so. Mary Jane herself apparently became quite ill during the spring break so she couldn't return to St. Mary's Hall. She went to the Woodruff's house to recover. Finally, it was mid-June of 1865 and she was gonna go home to the Midwest. While she had grown up in New Diggins, Wisconsin, <clears throat> George and Tamer were in the midst of making a move to a lovely brick home in Galena on Lower Bench Street. The Greek Revival home was built <clears throat> in about 1844. Mary Jane had not seen her mother or siblings for almost two years. Tamer fantasized about seeing her daughter writing, we are so glad to hear you was so much better and is a great burden off our mind. And I think now, if you was at home, you would soon be well. Won't it be a glorious 4th of July if you can get home? The children have been teasing for to go someplace to spend the 4th. When I told them that perhaps Mary would be here, they all shouted, it'll do, that'll do, oh, that's the best thing in the world. I tell them they will not know you, but they won't believe that. Nettie says she would know you half a mile off. As for me, I called on Mrs. Ernest's mother last week, and she says, I am not a bit changed since she saw me seven years ago. So I would guess you would know your mother wherever you meet her. As I mentioned, letters between Ma and Mary Jane can be very playful and at times confidential. In closing her June 17, 1865 letter, Tamer wrote, ask Mr. Woodruff if he remembers me passing him a counterfeit $5 bill. That's the last time I saw him. It made me feel rather cheap for I didn't know I had such a thing in my possession. If you should come home with Mr. Ernest, do not say anything about the school. I don't want them to know anything against it because we've both been bragging about our selection of your school. Mary Jane and family settled into the home on Lower Bench Street. For the next 75 years, it was the Galena home for the Leakley family, and they kept returning to it. Unfortunately, George's health declined further until at age 42, he died of consumption or tuberculosis. 1866. It must have been a great loss to Tamer, Mary Jane, and all of her siblings. George had left them in good financial condition. He left about 265 acres in New Diggins Township, where he had a house, fields, a smelter, and lead mines. He also had interest in other businesses with his brother Thomas and Galena. The Galena home was a comfortable and elegant edifice. George stipulated in his will that he wanted the income from leasing the farmland, smelter, and mines to support the family. The income allowed for a comfortable lifestyle. Tragedy struck the family in 1867 when one summer, Tamer's 15-year-old son John drowned in the Galena River. The newspaper account of the accident tells how John and a buddy took out a boat and got caught on a large branch near the bridge. Their boat capsized. John couldn't swim and was going under. His friend caught hold of his hand in an attempt to save him, but their hands slipped out from one another and John went down. Relatives say that Tamer dressed in black from that day on. Mary Jane probably finished her formal education at Galena High School. She was also getting reacquainted with her first cousin, James Frederick Leakley, the boy called Fred, who took leave of the Civil War due to illness. Their relationship resulted in a pregnancy in late January, 1868. Mary Jane was 18 years old. Fred was 21. Into her fourth month, she and her cousin Fred married. They raised 10 children on the farm on Council Hill Road and in Galena in a row house on Bench Street. And that's the picture of the farmhouse. <laughs> so the next generation was brought into the world 
However, most of their children left Galena in the 1880s and 90s as opportunities in the town that time, time forgot became scarce. They all returned as a family in 1911 for Mary Jane's funeral. Letters from Mary Jane and Fred to their adult children who moved as far away as Alaska were also saved. These letters dated from the 1880s reveal that the same love and concern for one another as the boarding school letters. As voyeurs of their private correspondence, we in the 21st century could only wish to receive such sweet letters on monogrammed stationery, so deliberately written, sharing heartfelt thoughts with those we love. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.